Hey everybody, Dr. G here. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and body language expert, and today we're going to be analyzing the top five times that serial killers and psychopaths got absorbed in fantasy on camera. What we're going to be looking at is their body language during these moments. We're also going to look at various themes that emerge that tell us more about how they experience these memories. Before we get started, I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right, let's go. So the first one we're going to be watching is Ted Bundy. What we're going to be looking at is a clip from Ted Bundy's final interview. He's being asked about when he finally decided to start committing these acts. Do you remember where you decided to throw caution to the wind? Again, when you say pushed, I don't. I, I know what you're saying. I don't want to. Now, one thing you'll see is that his eyes are closed. During this interview, he says a lot of things that aren't true. And oftentimes when he does that, he closes his eyes because I don't think that he likes what he's doing. So that's not as much what we're going to see as he's re-experiencing. That's the less relevant part of it. But I want to explain now why he's doing that. If you watch the whole interview, it becomes a lot more clear. Had an, was, was an indispensable link in the chain of behavior, the chain of events that led to the behaviors, to the to the. This is a baseline of what he's normally like. This is very different than what he looks like when he's re-experiencing the things that he did. We're going to get to that in just one second. Assaults to the murders and what, and what have you. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to describe. Uh, All right, so you see the little tongue flick. You see him do this occasionally, but right now he's starting to feel excitement, and that makes the mouth dry up. So you see the tongue flick. We see serial killers do this a lot. And if you watch interviews with serial killers, even if they're not flicking their tongue very often or licking their lips, when they start going back into these memories, they oftentimes do. Uh, the, the sensation of the, the... So you can see his entire body is contorting. He's feeling this all over again. This is someone who is truly in ecstasy right now as he takes himself back to these moments. Of, of reaching that point where, you, where I knew that it was like something had, say, snapped, that I knew that... Uh, and then he phases back into a lot more normal way of speaking. We're going to go back through that again, but I'm going to like go for just a second, and then we're going to jump back. I couldn't control it anymore. That these barriers that, that I had had been uh, I had learned as a child uh, that had been instilled in me were not enough to hold me back. So you see, he goes right back into intellectual mode. One thing to understand about the way that the brain works is that the th the thinking. And the feeling parts of the brain are separate. When we feel really intensely, it tends to push logic out of the way a bit. So oftentimes, looking at someone who is feeling strongly versus someone who is entirely thinking about something looks quite different. And he has flipped back and forth very quickly between thinking to intensely feeling to thinking again. Let's go back and we're going to talk about his various themes about what he re-experiences. Very difficult thing to describe. Uh, 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 the so right there, you see him biting his lip. You see him literally feeling with his hands. He's someone who's very tactile. So this is very different than BTK, which we're going to talk about. Dennis Rader has a very different type of experience with his murders. And so if you look, there's something about that that he must have been pursuing. He is pursuing sensations. He's pursuing this sort of ecstasy that he experiences when he goes back to when he finally decided to do this. And if you watch this entire interview with all the various things he talks about, this is the one time you really see him go deeply into this. The sensation. So it's rare that you see something genuine from him, and that's what's interesting. Afterward, he said the sensation. Of the... the, 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 the of, of reaching that. And then he jumps right back in. And this is very contrary to what he wants to do in this interview. Because the goal of this interview, I presume, was to get a stay of execution. Because he was basically telling Dr. Dobson everything he wanted to hear. And I think he was hoping that he would get a stay of execution because he was playing along and because he was being agreeable and all this stuff. But right here, you're getting a really quick glimpse of what he's actually like. Point where, you, where I knew that it was like something had, say, snapped, that I knew that uh, that I couldn't control it anymore. 
And see, he also goes back to speaking more quickly afterwards. When he's re-experiencing it, I think that he is fully immersed in that moment. I don't want to know what was going on in his head at the time, but when he had asked, what pushed you to finally do this? He must have been back in there for just a minute. So I think right there, you're getting to see Ted Bundy re-experiencing in a very real way the awful things that he did. I'm going to keep going for one minute because there's one other interesting thing I want to show you. I showed this on my other, other video about Ted Bundy, but I want you to see it anyway. Frenzy, a sexual frenzy. Well, yes, it, that's one way to describe it. A compulsion. A, a, a. Now, he had just let his guard down, but for a brief second, you see the other part of Ted Bundy. Before you saw the part of him enjoying himself, the part of him that feels ecstasy by the awful things that he does. And right here, you see Ted Bundy, the predator, while he's searching for prey. Watch this right here. One way to describe it, a compulsion. A, a, a. So whether it was because he was interrupted or whether it's because it startled him, this is the face of Ted Bundy, the predator. And it comes very shortly after he let himself be vulnerable for a brief second. He let himself go back into those moments of ecstasy that he experienced during those awful, awful things that he did. So it's interesting how this shortly follows that, the juxtaposition of seeing the hunter predator Ted Bundy right here, and then the Ted Bundy who is experiencing what he had done. So if we're to summarize Ted Bundy and the types of body language he was showing, he's someone who's very tactile. He's someone who seems to be seeking sensations and experiences. It's a little bit different than Dennis Rader, who we're going to look at next. Now let's watch Dennis Rader talking about the Otero murders. Was she also tied up there in the yes, bedroom? Yes, uh -huh. yeah, both her hands and their feet were tied up. She was on the bed. Where were the children? Uh, well, So as you can see, the way that he speaks is very plain. I talk about in another video of BTK that he feels a lot, that his feelings are very intense, but he's able to control those feelings. He doesn't show a lot. But let's see the things that he does show. Uh, Josephine was on the bed and uh, Junior was on the floor. Dennis Rader is someone who's very spatial. You can literally see him looking around as though he's there when he's talking about what he's remembering. In the brief moments, he'll actually show you some body language. That's what he's doing. He's literally looking down as though he's there. And if you've heard him talk about what the experience is like, the kinds of fantasies that he has, he sees it as though he's the director and producer. He sees it almost like a movie. So when he re-experiences things, it's very spatial. It's like he's actually there. Ted Bundy is more about sensations. Dennis Rader is more about experiencing it like it's a movie or like it's something that he's reliving in that sense. He also has talked about something called cubing, where he cubes various personalities. That's a really strange way to put it, but basically he puts them in these cubes with various sides. I'm not going to go into a deep explanation of it, but understand he's very visual spatial. He thinks of things in shapes and space. So when he's going back and re-experiencing this, it's almost like going back and re-experiencing it as a three-dimensional movie, I think. So we're, we're talking, first of all, about Joseph Otero. So you'd put the bag over his head and tied it, mm -hmm. and he did not die right away. Can you tell me what happened in regards to Joseph? Uh, he moved over real quick, like, and I think tore a hole in the bag, and I could tell that he was having some problems. And you could also see where he's looking after he says this. Tied it, mm -hmm. and he did not die right away. Can you tell me what happened in regards to Joseph? Uh, he moved over real quick, like. He moved over real quick, like, and then he looks over there. Once again, I think that he's visualizing and mapping out everything that happened as he's talking about it. So he's somebody that really, truly re-experiences things in three dimensions. And I think he tore a hole in the bag, and I could tell that he was having some problems there. So now we're going to watch Gary Ridgway. He's going to talk about how he fooled people into thinking that he was a good guy. Woman. I mean, you had to have a way of feeling them out, and... Um, saying, I think ruse number one, two, three will work with this woman. How, how, tell me, explain that process to me. Well, one of them was, as you, as I, they would, a uh, woman would get in the car. Now, Gary Ridgway tends to be very anxious. His communication style is anxious. He tends to be a little bit shaky. And so you're going to watch him trying to soothe himself a lot as he talks about these things. He wants to see my ID. So I whipped out my ID, and with my ID would be my, I'd put my finger over my driver's license to hide my name. Now, part of what he does is he connects so much to the interviewer. 
And maybe it's because it's a woman is why he's doing this. But he's so intent on talking to her, he's playing this out without even looking at it. And that could be part of his avoidance. Anxious people tend to avoid, and he seems like he tends to get very anxious. And so he may not even like fully looking at what it is that he's doing. But on the opposite side was um, pictures. And, uh... As he's doing this, he's rubbing his fingers. We do that to soothe ourselves. Pictures. I'm a picture of my son. And then see, to see my son and they would know I was a probably normal person. But you were really using your son as part of your ruse. This is only all well, the time I didn't want to picture my ex-wife there, so I had a picture of my son. So he gets testy and irritable sometimes too. But he's getting anxious he's getting agitated as he talks about this so he's somebody that feels discomfort and frustration when he goes back and re-experiences things that he's done he's constantly trying to calm himself so when we look at the theme that emerges for him is that he's anxious when he re-experiences these things but there's also an odd intensity about him now we're going to watch part of an interview with jeffrey dahmer from inside edition he's going to be talking about some fairly disturbing things so i just wanted to give you a heads up i was uh branching out that's when the cannibalism started eating of the heart and uh, the arm muscle so one thing you'll notice about his body language is it is very very controlled he's very middle of the road very calm he wants to be in absolute control all of his murders were done with absolute control that's what he wanted so you're going to see that reflected in his body language let's keep going but i've got a lot more to say about him it was a way of uh, making me feel that uh, they were a part of me. Let's rewatch this clip because there's a couple of other things we should point out. This uh, branching out, that's when the cannibalism started eating of the heart and uh, the arm muscle. Now you'll notice also that he locks eyes with her when he gives her specific details, when he says heart and arm muscle. He looks directly at the interviewer. And he's also being very specific, saying arm muscle. That goes back to that controlling and precise nature. He wants to, her to specifically know the details of what it was that he ate. I mean, I know it's disturbing for most of us to even hear him talk about it. But for him, it's very important that he use precision in all of this because that goes back to that theme of control. It was a way of uh, making me feel that uh, they were... Now, I mentioned excitement. You hear him saying that was uh, he's taking heavier breaths because this is possibly exciting for him to talk about. He seems to be conflicted about it. He does talk about the fact that he doesn't like the fact that he did these things, but I think that it still excites him to discuss it. were a part of me. It, it, for, at first, it was just curiosity. And that was interesting. When he starts blinking really fast, that's usually associated with stress. He's saying first it was just curiosity. Watch this part. Part of me. It, it, for at first, it was just curiosity, and then it became compulsive. Then I tried to uh, keep the person alive. By and then you hear that, that heavy sigh again. And if you look at his pupils right here, now they look somewhat dilated. I can't tell if they were quite as dilated before, but as he's getting ready to talk about zombifying people, which is what he's about to say, is his eyes are quite dilated. So when taking in that deep breath... That suggests that he is getting excited during this. Because think about it, your heart pumps when you get more excited. So you need to take deeper breaths because that helps you regulate the amount of oxygen in your body. So there's got to be some reason that he's breathing heavier. So I assume, once again, there's probably some excitement when discussing this. I'm going to go back, and then we're going to let this play through. Then I tried to uh, keep the person alive by inducing a zombie-like state. Um by uh, injecting uh, first a dilute acid solution into their brain or uh, hot water. You'll also notice he always looks up at the interviewer when he's giving specific details. It shows a couple of things. One is that he wants people to know the specific details. He's very precise. Two is that I think that it's also a way to intimidate and make people feel uncomfortable. There's something about meeting his eyes when he is talking about the more disturbing aspects of this that is probably important to him. So 
This is someone who is all about control, and that's what we're seeing thematically with his body language as we watch Jeffrey Dahmer talk about the things that he did and re-experience the things that he did. Now we're going to watch part of an interview with Ed Kemper. I very recently released another video on Ed Kemper going into much greater detail, but in this part we're going to be watching where he talks about murdering two co-eds. This is the middle of the story, but it's going to give you some idea of how he communicates these things and how he re-experiences this. Back and she gasped. And I think, whoa, I don't want her to know what happened. I said, your friend got smart with me. She'd been getting really smart with me a lot, but I never hit her. I killed her, but I didn't hit her. So there was a lot right there. Let's go back and watch this part, and then we're going to continue on. Now, you'll notice that he does an impersonation of what he said when he was there. This is someone who is a storyteller, and that's very much how he re-experiences these. He's sharing this experience with the person who's interviewing him, and he wants to tell it like a story, and he's good at telling stories. L listen to this part right here. Like, whoa, I don't want her to know what happened. I said, your friend got smart with me. She'd been getting really smart with me a lot. See, right there, he's going back into exactly how he probably said it back then. He also licked his lips right before that, as I point out that many serial killers do, because he's getting excited by talking about this. We're going to keep going, but you're going to see something else in just one second. But I never hit her. I killed her. And so here you can see a smile. It's not the only time he's going to do this. He does this a lot. If you watch my full video about him, I talk a lot about the joy he gets when talking about the murders that he's committed. He does seem to really take great pride and joy when he thinks back on these. But I didn't hit her. I said, your friend got smart with me and I hit her. And this is just part of a reenactment, by the way. I think I broke her nose. You better come help. She's about to die. Why, do, why does she have to know that? I couldn't deal with telling her that. So this is part of how he's a good storyteller. He connects with audience. He has a great sense of audience because he knows to say, why couldn't I tell her that? So he looks at his own faults and all of this, asks the kinds of questions that we might ask or me, we might be wondering about. So when he goes back and re-experiences these things, he does seem to be experiencing happiness and joy while also doing it in a way that connects with an audience. Smart with me and I hit her. I think I broke her nose. You better come help. She's about to die. Why, do, why does she have to know that? And there's also a slight smile on his face. I couldn't deal with telling her that. And when I attacked her, she didn't at first realize what was happening. It didn't go through. She had very heavy coveralls on. It knocked her right up into the lid of the car. See, as he's becoming a storyteller, he's giving details like having heavy coveralls, knocking her up to the roof of the car, the way that he's looking up. I don't think that he re-experiences this the same way that someone like Dennis Rader does. Because I think Dennis Rader very much is literally mentally in a three-dimensional space. I think he is connecting with his audience. He's thinking, how do I tell a compelling story? So it's different. But it didn't pierce the clothing. So it wasn't that swell a knife anyway. I went out and bought a, a pawn shop huge knife. And uh, I kept on just mindlessly attacking. She falls back into the trunk. I just killed a young woman. I slammed down the lid of the trunk. She isn't dead. She's dying. And I panicked. I thought, I just locked the car keys in because I can't find them in my pocket. Oh, my God. I locked them in the trunk. I mean, look at the way that he's telling the story, right? When you see people give confessions oftentimes, you know, you look at someone like Jeffrey Dahmer. He speaks plainly about it. He doesn't talk about it in the way that he does. He doesn't try to connect with a sense of audience like he does. It's really interesting, and I think this is part of Ed Kemper's strength, and it's probably why he would read audiobooks and record those because apparently that's something that he would do from prison, that he does have a sense of audience. He knows how to tell a story, and, th and so that's very much what he's doing right now. And it is compelling. There are a lot of people that will get sucked in by him because he's a good storyteller. He is a good orator. I'm kicking on the trunk lid and yanking on it. Oh, no, I don't believe this. I started to run, and I tripped over the gun that I'd had in my pants that I had totally forgotten was there. I stopped. I said, stop and think. I collected my wits. Check all your pockets. I picked the gun up. I stuck it back in my pants. And right now, we're connecting with his experience of this. Rather than being able to connect with the awfulness of what he's done and what he's doing, I mean, he's literally talking about that he can't find his keys when there is a body in his trunk, someone who is dying, literally. 
And yet, because of the way that he says this, we're connecting with his part of the story. We're thinking about whether or not he locked his keys in the trunk because he thinks that may have been what happened. Now remembering I had one, I checked all my pockets and there's the keys in the back pocket. I never put them in my back pocket. So for him, when you really think about this, this is sort of the the peak of the story is that he misplaced his keys and he was able to find them. And it's very interesting how he draws people in with this because that is a compelling detail, thinking about somebody making these kinds of mistakes. But at the same time, what he's discussing is so horrific, he's able to put some distance there. So when we look at his theme when it comes to his body language, when it comes to him re-experiencing these things, his is his ability to connect with an audience and describe it and share his experiences with people because I think that that's really what he wants to do. So hopefully this has been interesting to you. If you like this format, if you like me covering them in this way and doing top top lists, top five lists, top ten lists, those sorts of things, I'm happy to do so. There's so many different things that we can look at about these various people and about these interviews that we've got. So if you have any ideas, please leave them in the comments below. As many people know that watch my videos, I do get ideas from videos from my comments. I really do. So please let me know anything that you'd like to see. Last thing before we get finished up, I do want to remind you to like and subscribe if you want to see more content just like this. All right. Thanks for watching.